Tonight we have a special treat because uh, we're going to be actually having a little conversation or interview and, and Paul will be leading the way. Thanks, Stacey. So good evening, everybody. Um, since we're talking about Bucky Fuller, um, the first thing I wanted to point out is that we're honored to have uh, Bucky's daughter, Allegra Fuller. She's just sitting down now. She joined us at dinner and we got to, we got to uh, hear stories. And although the conversation is going to be with Jonathan Keats, I felt like if we didn't have a little bit of Buckminster Fuller, it would be like Hamlet the play without the prince. So if we can switch to my laptop, I will um, stream a little clip so that you can hear Bucky in his own voice. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's such an interesting thing to think about the, the person who formulated the idea of comprehensive anticipatory design. So here, we're going to start with a couple minutes of hearing Buckminster Fuller in his own voice. and we don't need as much of this as I was planning on showing you, okay? Um, for whatever reason, you see that. I'm sorry that we're not getting sound. But now let me invite up Jonathan Keats. Welcome, Jonathan. Jonathan Keats has been, <clears throat> has been writing Jargon Watch since 2006 or so for Wired. He's also a pornographer for deities and plants. And uh, his most recent book is the one that we're going to be using as a point of departure. Uh, we'll be learning about and talking about Bucky Fuller. At the same time, it will give us an opportunity to kind of move between the visionary, productive intellect of Bucky Fuller and some of the playful poetry of ideas that Jonathan Keats' own work has done. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Let's start with a question, why Bucky Fuller? Why now? Buckminster Fuller seems to have, on the one hand, anticipated so many of the great problems that we face now even more than in his own time. So if you think about the state of the environment in the Anthropocene, in the midst of this great mass extinction on the one hand, and you think about the level of inequality, globally speaking, uh, economic, and also the level of conflict, these are, as you read his works, going all the way back, problems that he was identifying and that today are seemingly more pervasive and more intractable than ever before. And on the other hand, it seemed to me, as I was reading his words and thinking about his ideas, that many of the approaches that he had are potentially more accessible now than in his own time. Biobamesis, for instance, was one of his great um, principles at a certain level of trying to figure out how, how nature builds, as he put it. And if you look at, on the one hand, where, where biology has taken us in terms of our sheer knowledge of these biological systems, and also if you start to look at it from the, the standpoint of nanomaterials and the ability to engineer at this incredible level of specificity, you start to see that some of what he was foreseeing and vaguely alluding to as uh, being a matter of getting some better alloys, that now maybe these things are possible. And then I think thirdly is the fact that we seem at this point to be very much in the business of talking about world changing. It has become a cliche at the level that I think 
more or less it could be a kind of shorthand for the TED talk or for the Davos conference, etc. And yet at the same time it seems that this world changing that we talk about is really nowhere near the sort of comprehensive anticipatory design science that Fuller himself embodied. Uh, he was looking for some sort of way in which to think at, uh, to, 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 to bring together disciplines in ways that we've actually gone in the opposite direction of only making them more, um, more cloistered, more sequestered, uh, making it more difficult to communicate. So it seems that because he was identifying these problems and was proposing solutions, and those solutions seem actually to have some potential resonance now, and because we seem on our own to desperately want to get where he was trying to go and yet seem to be totally inept as far as getting there, it seems like he's a very good person for us to revisit today. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's going to be the whole of our talk, okay? Is good, just, we're done. Yes, I mean, we nailed it. And now I'd just like you to expand a little bit on the idea of comprehensive anticipatory design science. I, I, am I right in that, like, that was the chain? It was comprehensive because it was about 100% of humanity. It was anticipatory. I'd like you to explain a little bit of that. And then design is such a gushy, you know, of the moment term. But he really paid attention to that long before others did. And then finally, the science. So the, let's go through and you know, start with comprehensive. I, I remember that on page 23, I think it was, you have like a great uh, way that he says it, if, if, if you don't. Yes, it's good that you remember, because yeah. I, I vaguely, I think I wrote this book, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> At some point, if you see right okay. there, he kind sure. of, do you want to read his definition and then talk about it? It's in the brackets. Sure. Um, Fuller explained comprehensive anticipatory design science many times and in many ways. Yet his most eloquent and succinct definition of the practice was, quote, to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. Great. That's helpful. And now, talk a little bit more about that. Because like, the comprehensive is clearly his signature, right? Is like spaceship Earth, thinking about the flow of energy across not just you know, one place, but across the, the interactions. And then, what's the anticipatory part? I, I wasn't sure I understood that. Was that his anticipation, or? I'm not sure whether I do either, let alone any of the other parts. But I'll hazard a guess, having spent a little bit of time with this material, and say that I think, first of all, in terms of comprehensiveness, that it really has a lot to do with the, on the one hand, the ability to perceive in a way that is so ubiquitous as to find patterns that are essential but would otherwise be invisible. And that that only becomes possible if you yourself are comprehensive in your interests and comprehensive in your pursuits of those interests. And therefore that really for a university to be comprehensive, to be universal, doesn't do it because there's no real communication necessarily between the parts, whereas the individual as a sort of comprehensive being has the ability to negotiate all that and to find those patterns. The anticipatory part comes perhaps out of that, but also perhaps motivates it. Maybe there's sort of a bootstrapping that takes place. To, to me, to be anticipatory is not to solve for the problem immediately at hand, nor even to define your problem in a way that makes it so that you cannot bootstrap it to something bigger and something more uh, significant, but rather to attempt to work out what might be the bigger question, to work out what might be represented as the broader set of problems that a given problem has. And because 
solving for that individual problem may or may not address the real deeper reason why you're doing this in the first place to try to anticipate that in order not to end up in a sort of a, a hill climbing situation, to use an engineering term, to not end up in this situation where you are, um, where you end up isolated at a point of having solved an individual problem that actually gets you farther from the larger problem set. Okay, and then um, the last two parts, design and science, did he think of it as a science of design or did he think of it as using science for purposes of design. I never really... Uh, I, was I would like to believe the latter, and one of the many places where I part ways with him is in the fact that I think that it was also for him at least as much the former. That is to say that, to me, science as a pursuit of experimentation as a sort of formalized mode of curiosity seems like it is a very powerful way in which to inform design in the broadest sense of the word. That is to say, the organization of society. So the patterns that have been recognized in the comprehensiveness to then to try to prioritize them in ways through design to make it so that they will be anticipati anticipating future problems. I think that where it can go awry is where it turns into a conviction that there is some operating system of the universe, that that has been cracked, and that that can be applied in a way that will design for all problems. Uh, so in a sense, I think that Science as a practice of iterative ignorance, so to speak, of, 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 of iterative learning in order to learn what you don't yet know, the humble quality that science has had and has is to me where it works, that, because that leaves the flexibility necessary. But science also is amongst the most arrogant of professions. Uh, Richard Dawkins is possibly the most arrogant man on earth. Um, then again, there are plenty of people on the religious side of the spectrum who are equally arrogant. Uh, so maybe we could discuss that later. But to me, there is a way in which science can very easily turn into dogma. And I sense that often when Fuller would refer to geometry in an almost mystical way and claim that that was a scientifically valid principle throughout the universe, that it was getting into the realm of Dawkins and away from the realm of, 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 of science as a, as a sort of perpetual curiosity. Uh -huh. so, but he was both. Right. I, I don't want to suggest that he was one or the other, and I think that his inconsistencies are a large part of what makes him so human and what makes him so tolerable over the course of an entire book for me to write, though it is not a biography necessarily, it meant spending a lot of time with him, having never met him, having never encountered him except from afar, seeing a dome being built once when I was five years old, I think. Okay. Maybe six. All right. And since we we're talking about it in terms of design, I mean, I think what's, what's really interesting about Bucky Fuller's vision was that he really put so much energy into getting people to make things with him in his pedagogy. Do you want to talk about that? Because it's a really interesting point of departure for you in the book. Mm -hmm. And so the first question is just like, was he always trying to get people to make things, or was it trying to get people to kind of be his hands and make his things? Again, I would like to believe that it was purely the former. I would not fall into the trap of saying that it was totally the latter, but to me it does seem that 
the former led to a greater degree as time passed in the direction of the latter. So I think that Fuller always understood making things as a way of tangibly engaging the world and of understanding the world through that engagement. He also, I believe, always thought that ultimately it was about making things, that that was where ideas have to prove themselves at some level. Will it stand or, will, will it, or won't it? And as an educator, he was remarkable for the fact that he seems to have been more able than most to get people to undertake that process. You hear about students such as Ruth Asawa, one of the great artists of the, from the Bay Area of the second half of the century, in my opinion, one of the great sculptors, who talks with great reverence about Fuller at Black Mountain College and how that really led her to the sort of work that she did. So I think that that is absolutely there. But I think that there was also the fact that he was always out he was always looking for cheap labor. He had to for, if not his entire life, at least most of it. And that doesn't seem dishonorable to me. It seems you have to do that if you're going to try to bring your vision into the world. But where it becomes problematic, I think, is at the point where it, it kind of begins to feel a little bit begrudging or even, even selfish in terms of his wanting to control the product that came about through others who were making things on his behalf. And even in the somewhat infamous case of Kenneth Snelson, mm -hmm. being a case in which there's a very strong argument to be made that while Fuller was exploring ideas that were tangentially connected to those that Snelson was discovering through hit the sculpture that he was making while he was studying under Fuller, that is to say, what Fuller called tensegrity, or this um, perfect balance of tension and compression, that certainly, historically, it looks as if Snelson had this thing that Fuller realized that he could use. And that seems fine, but it seems that Fuller could certainly have been a lot more generous in terms of uh, allowing for the fact that Snelson might have come up with an idea, and that that idea might contribute to some sort of a broader uh, way in, a, a broader relationship of makers and their ideas, a more communal way of making. OK, so that's going to be a really interesting place to just help people understand. Uh, first, pro I, I don't have any of Snelson's uh, work to show. I did try and get some pictures. But you know, uh, um, at dinner, we were talking about they, they look like pickup sticks that are kind of like beautifully aligned and have a certain uh, equilibrium so they continue to stand. Um, now, that happened at, at um, the Virginia or the North Carolina College. What is that? At Black Mountain. Black Mountain. Yes. So that Black Mountain was also where he built one of his first geodesic domes. Correct. Is that right? Now, what's the sequence there? Was it like Snielsen showed this tensegrity, and then Bucky said, oh, let's build a dome? Or was he already thinking domes, and then he saw more richness by having this student articulate tensegrity. I'm going to mangle this. And all the engineers in the room are going to correct me here, um, as are the historians. But I will give it a try. So my understanding is that Fuller was thinking about conceptualizing and even built the first dome, the so-called supine dome, before Snelson came along with his tensegrity mast, or with uh, his um, double X figure, I think is what he called it. And so as, a, as far as the history is concerned, I'm quite convinced of the fact that the dome precedes Snelson. Snelson encounters Fuller, encounters the dome. It leads him to this insight about how to do something that involves the balance of compression and tension, which only would have occurred to him, most likely, as a question to ask himself as a sculptor for the fact that Fuller was insisting on the significance of that as a structural 
means by which to, uh, to build shelter. That said, my understanding is that tensegrity is, Fuller claimed that tensegrity was a special case of the, of the geodesic dome. My understanding is that it was not a special case, but was a parallel means by which to achieve a balance of compression and tension, and therefore would stand in a court of law as a matter of intellectual property, even if Fuller had a patent on the dome, as being a valid invention in its own right. And whether that's ultimately the standard that we should abide by uh, is open to discussion. But I think that's a way of starting to say that, that, that Snelson was taking the problem that Fuller had posed, finding another solution that was at some level equivalent to it, but was independent of it. Okay. And then Fuller was taking that and saying, I don't have to build sculpture that way. I could build a dome that way. And so then there is a tensegrity based dome that is a very different sort of a dome because if you look at the, at the standard geodesic dome, it's, it's all struts. Whereas a tensegrity based dome involves struts and strings basically. So they're different, different in appearance. They're similar in Let's principle at, at some level. Can, can you say like, is that a tensegrity dome? The um, one that his head is? That, that is a dome. That, that, as far as I can tell, there are no wires involved. Um, and the one in Montreal, was that a tensegrity dome? No, or? that was a dome as well. OK, OK. So all right, well. Um, but tensegrity was particularly useful in the case of building tower type structures. And again, you, since I opened up the intellectual property conversation, uh, again, we have to then say, many of these things have been independently invented more than once. The, the, the geodesic dome, not called that, is effectively the structure at a mathematical level of the Zeiss Planetarium that was built independently decades before by an architect who had no knowledge of Fuller and vice versa, most likely. Mm -hmm. So two independent inventions. Why Fuller's is by far the more interesting, ultimately, is because he saw the generality of what that structure could be and what it could do, as opposed to simply the fact that it might solve for this one problem of how to make this, this given planetarium. Okay. Um, in the case, just to finish this thought, uh, in the case of the tensegrity mast, uh, I've seen some evidence that uh, I believe Alexander Graham Bell was exploring, I think it was Bell, I'm probably getting that wrong, was exploring um, some of these ideas long before. But again, independent invention is something that happens all the time. And ultimately, it has to do with what you do with it. And so that allows me to come back around to Snelson fortuitously here and to say that Snelson was building sculptures. Fuller was not building sculptures, even if there might have been sculptural qualities to what he was making. Fuller was therefore truly the inventor of the tensegrity, uh, the tensegrity mass as an engineering phenomenon, even if he was not the inventor of tensegrity as a structure in the first place. OK. So I want to show a picture of his car. Let's see if that's going to work. Boom. There we go. So this is the Dymaxion car. It's not it's in all its glory. But um, you know, I grew up hearing that it was like faster, more fuel efficient, and that there was just one fateful accident that prevented us from having this precursor to the Tesla 50 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the car and its story? Because, you know, um, it, it's, it's kind of cool. And I don't even know if there are any right now. Is that right? Are there any? There's like, one uh, in the, uh, what was the Harris collection, and now is the National Automobile Museum. And it has recently been restored, uh, as in just this year, a lot of the restoration has taken place. And that is on account of the fact that uh, Norman Foster, who was one of Fuller's associates when Foster was very young, was absolutely infatuated with the Dymaxion car and had one built, a new one built. And the deal was the old one got shipped to England. And in return for that, uh, 
that a lot of scholarship happened and also a lot of money came toward restoring it because what had happened, I'm kind of backing into this here, I know, and then I'll try, I'll circle around in a moment, but what had happened was that, okay, let me maybe start from the beginning and hope to get back to that point. It, start here, yes. start here with like, just what a crazy car it was, okay? And then like, talk about like, what he was trying to do with it, right. and then We'll, we'll definitely nest that with like his flying houses and all of that stuff. But can you start with the car as an example of like one of the I things? I don't think I can. No? Because I don't think that it is fair to what Fuller was after with the car. Okay, go ahead. Because this will get more comprehensive mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll so drop back down. A somewhat glib way of explaining how we end up with, you don't see that it has three wheels, but it does. Right. With a three-wheel car is the death of his first daughter, which he attributed, uh, it was of, of spinal meningitis with complications most likely, which he attributed to the, uh, the less than sanitary conditions that existed in cities at the time. He was at the time in Chicago, I believe, and so he, took the, the, the death of his first daughter as a sign that all was not well in the city. In fact, that cities were fundamentally um, a problem as far as if, if humans were to live in the way that they ought to, in which young girls don't die of spinal meningitis, that in fact what you needed to do was to, well, you needed to uh, drop bombs with a zeppelin in order to be able to plant masts in the ground so that you could put a house anywhere. So there were a couple of reasons for that line of reasoning, one of which had to do with the fact that part of the problem that he identified was the fact that the city was effectively kind of this cesspool where germs would accumulate in, in a sort of a, a slum situation and therefore what was needed was the opposite, that humans needed to be everywhere and that you needed to have the ability to have a house anywhere and to be able to go from any one place to any other. And secondly, that in order to be able to do that, houses need to be made in the most hygienic and also the most efficient way possible, which is to say in a factory using the same logic as the Model T Ford, but of course a Model T can be built in a factory because it's on wheels and you can drive it away. You can get it out of the factory, whereas a house can't be built in a factory since a house doesn't exist on wheels or by any other means of easy transportation until you start to think about what would happen if you were to make houses out of very light materials and you were to air deliver them and hang them, you can see oh, on the other picture earlier, oh, um, let's go back to you could see in the background, so those are some buildings that were along that principle. So basically the idea was that you could hang buildings on a mast, make them very light, make them very easy to get around, make them very inexpensive, very efficient in every way. But if you're going to do that, then you have to account for the fact that there may not be infrastructure. So getting the houses around is easy because you have a zeppelin, you drop a bomb, you then drop your, uh, your pole in the ground. That becomes the utility chassis. It becomes a way by which to get uh, plumbing and so forth into the house. But how are you going to be able to see your neighbors? There are not necessarily any roads. So therefore, you need a, a flying car. So a flying car is not so easy to build in the 1920s or today, for that matter, even though there were some efforts, and apparently some of them actually did fly uh, very briefly back at that time period. But he didn't want it to be any ordinary flying car. He wanted to have inflatable wings. So that wasn't going to work anytime soon. So therefore, he said, I'll build a ground taxiing mechanism for that, which became a three-wheel car, which then became the basis for an industry that he tried to build of making these cars. It was at the beginning of the Depression. There was an opportunity to open a factory and to take advantage of all of these unemployed Rolls-Royce workers as it happened. And so he started building these cars. And 
then, as you alluded to, there was the cars were very zippy and they were most likely not nearly as fast nor as fuel efficient as they have been claimed to be, but they were very impressive at the level of aerodynamics compared to many things that existed at the time. So then there was an accident at what seems to have been an accident as far as anybody knows at uh, in Chicago at the Chicago, Chicago World's Fair, bad press, the, uh, the business got shut down, it basically collapsed, and so that was the end of the cars, except that there were a few of them that existed from the prototype phase, one of which somehow managed to survive and ultimately ended up on a chicken farm in Arizona, where it was used as a coop and where it was recovered by some um, Arizona State University students who then sold it to Bill Hara because they couldn't get it working. Hara had the biggest car collection in the world, and so as a result, we have it today. But I think that what's interesting about the, one of the things that really interests me about this whole roundabout tale has to do with the fact that this is a very good case of a comprehensive way of thinking about a problem and how to address it. In other words, that thinking about the problem of how to control disease in a city results in a solution that is truly global in, in nature. Also, probably quite totally wrong-headed, as Fuller himself came to believe much later on when he came to see the city as really being the, uh, what was essential for humanity and the dome over Manhattan, the, the, his proposal to build a Jesus dome over Manhattan is and Tetra City, this city for uh, 100,000 people, I think it was. Uh, these were later manifestations of that total change of vision that he had. But it isn't to say that this comprehensivism, this anticipatory design is necessarily going to be right, but it is to say that that house on a mast and the idea of having this whole system by which you break the gridlock of the city by fundamentally rethinking how a society is built. That is comprehensive anticipatory design at its, at its best as long as it maintains a level of skepticism. And as long also as, and this is where it goes wrong, and this is the danger of it, and this is the danger of design more broadly, and maybe as a lesson to be learned about design for a career that has become one of the most popular today, maybe even more appropriate, is that ultimately he seems to have designed himself, working with Starling Burgess, who was the great yacht designer of his era, the two of them worked together on the design for this car. And they built something that was truly beautiful in a very unusual way and was a sort of thing that could get a man like Norman Foster totally infatuated with it. And that completely got isolated from the problem that it was meant to address in the first place and that caught Fuller and Burgess up in this process of research and development that to me does not seem to have been really at all going in the direction of the self uh, of the flying car and of the houses on mass. He comes back around to that later on, but that's another story. Uh, so it, it seems that he gets caught up in this, and then Norman Foster gets caught up in this, and then we tend to get caught up in it as well. It really was kind of the star of the exhibition at the Whitney Museum that was one of the points of reignition of Fuller's, uh, of, of interest in Fuller in, in the world today. This is in around 2008. So there's a way in which the, uh, Foster described the seductiveness of it. The seductiveness of it is something that is dangerous and that we are all susceptible to. And that includes the inventor himself in this case. So, um, so, so it's both, a, I think, a, an instructive and a cautionary tale, perhaps. That is so great, because like, here I am tugging on the car, and you pull in all of the, the kind of world changing that he did. I really had kind of focused on that like, little missile, that wiener mobile, <laughs> it just like, <laughs> flies along at a fast speed. And you're, 
explaining it in a way that I didn't even connect in the book. I mean, I mean, I, I knew you were mentioning Zeppelins dropping houses on masts, and I just hadn't seen how they were all connected. And um, I, I don't think we could come up with a better example, right, of this kind of panoptic way of like, you know, not just letting one little piece, but like trying to design every element that feeds into or feeds out of his, his vision. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really helpful. Now let me ask you, since we're talking about Dymaxion, I was really surprised. I always think of that as like, like something that Buckminster Fuller you know, kind of coined. But then in the book, you reveal that like some publicists gave him that word. They said, look, you use tension a lot, you use dynamism a lot, and you use maximum a lot. Why don't you just roll them all together? And so it was, it was not even his original term, is that right? Right, which, which Fuller was always very much upfront about. He also says that the, um, this, this was early in the period where Fuller was advocating for his houses on masts before the car had really become his focus. So in other words, we're talking about the uh, middle to late 20s, really. And he was on the road. He was pitching it to everybody and anybody trying to gain traction, trying to get developers interested, trying to get uh, the building industry interested, trying to get people to want these things. And so one of the opportunities that he had was, oddly enough, to present it at the Marshall Fields department store. And he was there every day, from what I understand, three or four times a day, five times a day, going through explaining this invention of his, which the Marshall Fields people saw as a great attraction and a good way to be able to sell in moder modern furniture line. So Marshall Fields had, a, had an ad man working for them who was enlisted to help Fuller come up with a more catchy name than the 4D house, which is what he was calling it for the most part at the time. And so listening to Fuller talk, generally speaking, it was the, the, it's believed to have been the words maximum, um, dynamic maximum and tension, though some people say dynamic maximum and ion are the three words. It doesn't really make much sense to me. But that Fuller kept using those words as he was presenting this house. And you can see why in terms of the fact that he was talking about a house that was deliverable by air, that it was based on the tension wire and the fact that tension is a much more efficient mechanism than compression given the materials available in his time, the most, a much more efficient way in terms of materials usage to be able to make a structure and to make it air deliverable on top of that. And that all of this was really about maximizing. So it was this beautiful 1920s kind of a word that um, I'm trying to remember the name of the man who came up with it. But then there are odd uh, trails away from that, he's, I don't know whether it was a word radar or uh, radio, it's a word radio that Fuller claimed was another word that this man had come up with. And I've looked far and wide. I have not been able to verify that. It, it seems to me that it was probably an element of the myth making that was okay. definitely a part of what Fuller used in order to sell his ideas and I think more profoundly to make sense of his world. So I'm going to ask you another neologism that I think of as Bucky Fuller's is synergy. Didn't he invent that one? Because I think of that as like synergetics was a book of his. And so is he the owner of that one? Do, I do don't, you know? I don't believe that he coined it. I uh -huh. believe that he popularized it. Okay. Uh, and this is also true for Spaceship Earth. Uh -huh. um, but in terms of where he took these words, it probably means more than who coined them. That is to say, what's interesting about language is what you do with it. And in the case of both Synergy and Spaceship Earth, Fuller used these words to crystallize ideas that came from many different places, because that is the nature of the comprehensivism that he was prone to that isolated them in a way that 
it was possible to have a conversation about them. And also, it was a way in which to popularize them. It was sort of the nature of comprehensivism is such that it is essential in order to be able to think profoundly about the problems of the world and how to solve them. But it also is a great conundrum as to how that becomes transportable to other people, mm -hmm. given that it needs to be something that not only one person comes up with in his or her head, but needs to be a much broader phenomenon. And so I think that what Fuller recognized early on and what was very important throughout his entire life was that coinage of new words or appropriation of words for his own purposes was a very powerful way in which to, as I said, to crystallize ideas and to essentially funnel I ideas coming from many places through a given point of communication with others where they could then diverge again. OK. And I had promised in the abstract that we would explore some rhymes with your book, work. And since you do jargon watch, I've always been curious, like, the, where do these things come from? I mean, like, when I read an, an issue of Wired and I find out that there's like all these weird terms, some of them obviously end up having legs, but very like, few of them, surprisingly uh, few. <laughs> right. It is. It is really like you know fruit flies that almost all die. But can you talk a little bit about like what's your radar for finding these kinds of things? Like how is it that you can pull out three or four of these in a month? My criteria are not the criteria of a futurist in the case of writing a column for Wired magazine. But rather, I see language as a way of reflecting on the interests that we have right now, the ideas that we are thinking about right now. So I'm not particularly interested in trying to predict which words will last, will stand the test of time. And I would be rather lousy at it if I were to have to do it. So it's kind of perhaps um, my own safety mechanism to say that I'm not interested in it. Um, I think but that- But still you find them. That's, I mean, I'm I not saying that you said, look, this is going to last. But just like, so, I never find these until I see them in your columns. So I think that it's, it's really a matter of being aware of that need to find four words in order to make <laughs> rent every month. You know, it's, it, it's probably relatively simple. It, uh, the, 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 the fringe benefits are that I end up reading a lot that maybe I would not otherwise. Mm -hmm. And particularly within the realm of science and technology, since that's fodder for, for Wired. But mm -hmm. it, in general, the, the journalistic part of my practice, which I would categorize Jargon Watch as being a part of, is a great mechanism for, uh, for encouraging curiosity and for pursuing it. And as much as I begrudge the fact that I have to transcribe interviews and would really love somebody here to invent software that can do it for me, anyone? Uh, I am nevertheless, I guess, I, I, th I see journalism as actually being something that is helpful in terms of this greater process of trying to explore and think about everything. Right. So if we're going to get back to everything, why don't we talk about the world game a little bit? Because that's such, a, that's such an interesting uh, kind of contribution that Bucky Fuller had, which was to like think about and, and why don't you just talk about it? Because I'm, I'm sure I won't, I won't do justice to it. Just talk about like what his, what his way of spinning that was and how, how it played out. Because it's so ahead of its time in certain ways. Well, again, it's one of these long stories of interconnections that really do, I think, capture his mind at work. And therefore, I find enthralling. And so. One place that you can trace it back to is his work at Phelps Dodge Corporation back in the 1920s, I believe it was. He was trying to work out whether copper prices were going to go up or down. Phelps Dodge was 
uh, copper mining was one of their businesses. And so comprehensivist that he was, he realized that in order to be able to figure out whether copper prices were going to go up or down and therefore how Phelps Dodge should position itself in terms of mining, that he had to know where all of the world's resources were and where all the needs were for every possible resource and how resources could get from any, any given place to any other. So not exactly what his bosses were probably asking him, but a very good way in which to address that question, probably the only way in which to address that question, and probably beyond the means even of big data processing today to do with the sort of prediction that Phelps Dodge would have liked. But nevertheless, it got him into this way of working, which another point of origin for it was in his Navy training, the fact that as a, as a naval officer training at Annapolis, a large part of it had to do with understanding naval routes and therefore understanding logistics and that really the game that he was playing with himself at Phelps Dodge and then that he later was playing with himself and with the public when he became a consultant for Fortune magazine and started to use this material in a way that he was publishing it, that this was the game of trying logistically to work out where everything was and where it needed to be and what the best way to get it from a suboptimal pattern into an optimal pattern. In other words, how to anticipatorily design comprehensively for the world as it was at that time, resulting through this thing that he would, I believe, have referred to as a science uh, to, to, to get to this optimal point. And so that then leads to various mean, means by which he would do this. And one of them becomes this attempt at logistically working out all of the great circles, uh, that is to say, the most efficient ways in which to get things around, which involved drawing on a globe. Uh, this was during World War II drawing those routes on a globe in order to be able to see how they might interrelate, finding that the pattern that was being drawn seemed like it might have uh, some interest structurally speaking, building the geodesic dome and so forth. So that's one direction that it goes. Another direction that it goes is in the direction of the world game, where he is thinking about could we, instead of war games, and this is his uh, linguistic sensibility at work perhaps initially, uh, there's no evidence of this, but just as a, uh, a, a supposition I'll throw out there, that it's his facility with language that I think leads to this slippage war game, world game, and then he starts thinking about what if we were to do what war games did in terms of gaming the optimal situation? What if we were to do it for, not for the purpose of war, but for the opposite? Uh, in, a, in which, as he often put it, in which every, everybody must win. So this is something that he describes as his own practice of in comprehensive anticipatory design science, but also that he then explores initially as a way in which world leaders might be able to come to some sort of consensus in terms of how they relate to each other. So here we're not really talking so much about resources anymore, though they are obviously a part of any conflict, but rather we're talking about relationships. And this is around the period of the Vietnam War, where he's thinking about could we put, could we, could we build a game, and he goes back around again to drawing those great circles on the globe, which allows him to unfold the globe in a way that makes the Dymaxian map makes this map that in which you can move around the pieces to see different relationships. Could we take that, make it a kind of a template, build this thing literally in Montreal, make it a template for having this game that would take place amongst world leaders in which you would try to find some sort of a global optimum for Spaceship Earth, in which all leaders were trying to work together toward the same end. Well, the US Information Agency doesn't really have much excitement about this, as you might guess. This is, once again, during the Vietnam War. And so he then takes this idea beyond that and explores it in various ways, 
uh, with the idea that it might be a way in which you could game optimal situations in which it wouldn't necessarily need to be world leaders, but rather in one, on the one hand, it could be a bunch of college students. And on the other hand, it could be a very expensive computer. So in the case of the college students, it's basically getting them into a room and kind of briefing them and allowing them to kind of play out, to try to play out various situations in the way that a war game would, but where the, the goal is for all parties to win. And that doesn't work very well because Fuller is far too big a figure with ideas of his own that are far too strong really to allow anybody to have the independence to come up with any solution other than the fact that we need a world energy grid over and over again. And while that's a great idea, it doesn't take into account all of the many problems that would go into making it happen, and including the fact that there's a Cold War going on and therefore having Soviet and US territory both supplying this world grid would require some world gaming that he never was willing or able to undertake. So on the one hand, you have this, um, th this sort of gaming by students, which ultimately he realizes is a dead end, I believe, because he then takes it back and he says, well, they were just playing. It was a way in which to teach people about comprehensive anticipatory design science, but I am the only one who can play this game. I am the comprehensive anticipatory design scientist. And then that leads to the other idea, which is war games are being played out at least to some limited extent at that time. There's some experimentation with computers to do so. And so he starts thinking about a computer that might be able to do this. And so then in the book Critical Path, you have these really interesting slippages in which he's talking in this sort of, the computer is him and world game is him. And they all kind of are in this interchangeable situation where it, it, it seems that he, again, in my opinion, has lost the power of the idea that he initially found which was the power of how through some sort of competition you can come up with solutions that were not foregone conclusions. That, that the problem with being the only one playing the game in his head or making a computer that does what happens inside his head even more deterministically is that you end up with a, again, with a sort of a hill climbing situation. Whereas what the world game initially was about, what was so profound about it, was the fact that it was to be played by all the world leaders. Or as I discuss in the book, I think today we could revisit this given the possibilities that are opened up by virtual worlds and by god games as kind of starting points, that this potentially could be played out by everybody. That it becomes potentially a, a way in which not only to have world leaders solving problems, but to have everybody solving problems. And if everybody agrees to do so, it can actually become a, a means by which collectively to make binding decisions. In other words, it, it has the potential to become an alternate viable, morally viable, and potentially even logistically viable form of democracy. And that's very interesting. And that is entirely coming out of, I think, what is the true profound idea that is at the core of what Fuller was, uh, was describing, but which because, again, I think it's a sort of tendency to get caught up in the design of it, to get caught up in some sort of a simpler manifestation of it and some sort of later manifestation that no longer embodies the entirety of it, that it ends up something that is actually quite possibly counterproductive. OK, yeah. I mean, I remember being really fascinated that it led through this route where you are talking about like SimCity and Sim, you know, these further and further environments, Second Life, when it was a real thing. And, you know, what I, what I was curious about in terms of Bucky Fuller's treatment was, was it supposed to be fun to play or was it just supposed to be like knowledge work or did, did you get a sense of whether there was any kind of enjoyment or 
challenge besides just cranking out an operations research I, matrix? Like, what was the what was the reason people would play it except for the solution? I don't know that there's any one solution or any any one answer to that question because it the word world game was used so many times in so many ways over the course of his lifetime that it could have been many different things. I think that there was some recognition that as as something that these students might play, that there needed to be some level of play involved, but they all look very serious in the photographs, so maybe that's not the case. In the case of the world leaders, I don't get the sense that he was really seeing this as some sort of a lark. I think that he was seeing this as hard work, and in that case, he was really talking about it in the same way that war games were being talked about and were being played at the time. And just as an interesting aside, there actually are some instances where the US government came quite close to doing some of what he was talking about uh, totally independently of him. The most interesting of which was probably that Robert Kennedy, not so long before he was assassinated, had the idea of trying to game the problem of, uh, of uh, racial inequality. And never happened, because once he was assassinated, that was the end of that program altogether. But it, it was something that was, I think, in the air at the time. And Fuller was maybe sensing that, maybe not, but kind of taking it to this utmost extreme of if war games can, can do what they do and can be so powerful, then just imagine what would happen if we got all the world leaders playing themselves to, to do this thing. So I'm going to open it up in just a second because I think other people have questions. You know, Jonathan's own work would have been such an interesting thing to compliment. I mean, uh, uh, do you want to just talk about one of your recent projects? I mean, I, I personally think the do-it-yourself universe kit is kind of cool, but you've, more recently you've been doing these really long time scale pinhole sure. photographs, and that, that definitely would rhyme with a lot of this really comprehensive vision of Bucky, and then we'll yeah. have take questions. I, I think that maybe that is the, uh, I'll, I'll attempt to be brief here, though I've already proven myself to be incapable of that, which may be part of my sympathy for Fuller is, um, well, he was the man who could go on for eight hours at a stretch sometimes. I will not, I promise. Um, so I, I started back in 2014, I think it was, in Berlin, undertaking a project in which I was, I designed a camera that has a hundred year long exposure time. So very simply, it is a pinhole camera letting in very low light. And rather than using film, which would spoil over the course of days, weeks, a couple of years at most, using black <clears throat> paper that will fade in sunlight. So that effectively what happens is that over a very long time, very slowly, the image gets, <coughs> gets faded. And so you have this very simple camera with no moving parts that's very cheap to build and that becomes possible, as I did in Berlin, to make a lot of them. So I worked with a, a, a collective called Team Titanic. We made a hundred of these cameras and then made them available to anyone in Berlin who wanted one, giving a deposit of 10 euros, taking a camera, hiding it somewhere in Berlin with the obligation that they leave in their will the information where they put it to a child who would then be responsible for retrieving it at that point in the future when it had been 100 years and bringing it back, receiving the 10 euro deposit, and then there would be an exhibition of these photos or however many of them came in. And so to me, it was a way in which to put surveillance into the hands of those most affected by the decisions we make, yet least empowered to do anything as far as making those decisions. That is to say, those who are not yet born. So in other words, it became a way in which to turn, turn surveillance around, make it something that we were all engaged in as a way of being able to look over ourselves, as a way of having that sort of 
well, it's sort of a paranoia almost that you could be being watched in anything that you did, in any decision that you made. However, because it was such a slow exposure, it would not be about any given thing that any individual did. If you were to stand in front of the camera and wave, it would have no effect whatsoever. But if you think about it over that 100-year time span, if it's looking out at a building that gets torn down and skyscraper goes up in its place, and you're talking about a span of 20 years for the one and, uh, and 80 for the other, you'll see a sort of a double exposure effect in which you'll be able to, to take the entire story of what happened at that urban level from the camera. So these cameras were put out in the world. I have no idea where any of them are. And that led me in two different directions of trying to build upon this, one of which was realizing that 100 cameras are not nearly enough. The chances of one of those 100 cameras coming up with a legitimate image are very, very slim. You need much bigger numbers. And also, it becomes much more interesting when there are much bigger numbers. Because what really is most interesting, I think, is not only the fact of being aware of the fact that you're being watched, but also of participating in terms of deciding what matters enough to watch over that time period. What sort of, what do I want to relate past my own lifespan? What sort of a relationship do I want to make past my own lifespan through that mechanism by which it gets handed off? So that led me to think about, we could really simplify this. Make it out of cardboard, a sheet of cardboard folded into a box would do the same thing, far less well, but could be done in far greater quantity. You poke a hole in one end, the other end is black uh, ink on paper, and you make millions of them. You make billions of them. You, in fact, make it a birthright for every child through UNESCO that they get one of these and that every day more of these cameras are going out in the world while others are coming in. And you build this sort of uh, this bridge, this relationship across time that's longer than the human lifespan. And given that the human lifespan seems to be, in many ways, one of these the limiting factors in terms of sense of responsibility, that it becomes a means by which to extend prosthetically through a technology beyond that. And so then, at the same time, to do a, a, to take a, a different approach of extending the span of time. So I've now built two cameras that have, you guessed it, a thousand year time span. And so those, of course, need to be much more thought through in terms of the engineering, in terms of the durability. So using solid gold uh, for the aperture, for instance, using adopting a Renaissance oil painting technique as a basis for the uh, film substrate based on light studies that have been done on various pigments. and building these into public places. So one of them at Arizona State University built into the museum, into the wall of the museum, and another one at Amherst College in Massachusetts built into a tower, the first one looking out at a city, uh, Tempe, Arizona, potentially our future, if you think about how cities arise and the importance of cities that they might have in our future, and yet at the same time, the precariousness of those cities when they're put in places where there's no water, for instance, it becomes a very interesting thing to be able to have that view over the long term. And then in the case of Amherst, Massachusetts, looking out at nature, so-called, looking at the Holyoke mountain range. And so in both of these cases, these become, to me, not so much about what will the picture look like in a thousand years, but or whether it will come out in the first place in a thousand years, but how we can see ourselves from the vantage of the far future. Basically, it becomes a sort of a, a telescopic mechanism through time for looking from the present into the far future in terms of the decisions that we make by being able to reflect back on ourselves from the far future in terms of the way in which those decisions relate to future decisions. And we get into that sort of contagious, comprehensive, anticipatory design thing that I guess is why I ended up writing the book that I did. Hey, Cal. Now, uh, when you do ask a question, be sure and get the mic. Raise your hand if you're 
Not yet. Oh, yeah? Uh, sits on a little podium so if you want to see it it's pretty cool um oh there it is um so um i guess the picture behind you there uh he's a multifaceted person <laughs> there there seem to be like a lot of ways to approach him and when i'm thinking about like maximizing and, and I, it, this triggered when you just said uh building cities in the desert he seems to be this sort of uh utopian sort of figure I think a lot of the Dymaxian stuff is a lot of people are probably interested just from a sort of kitsch aesthetic point of view like this sort of retro futurist utopian idea but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interesting kind of uh, philosophical uh, things behind this that it seems he seems very adjacent to like a Paolo Soleri and do you know his arcology sort of concepts and he also built in the desert and I'm wondering if, if, like, if that was a conscious decision, that, that, like, um, not on Solari's part, but, but for Fuller, if, if he ever sort of thought of the desert in similar ways in terms of saying, okay, if, if we have to maximize, then we should be put in the place where we really, really need to or something like this. Well, first, just as an historical aside, there, there's only one point at which Fuller and Solari collide uh, in a public way. There are, there are some quotes, one speaking about the other in a couple instances, but there was an exhibition at Brandeis University back in the 19, maybe the early 60s, uh, when Solari was deep at work on, um, I think on Cosanti at the time. And so there was, even at that early stage, some recognition of a confluence between the two of them at the same time that they were approaching utopia from very different places and going, going very different places with it. Uh, that is to say that Solari was really fascinated by the human body as a not only a, a metaphor for the city, but as a model for the city. Whereas Fuller was far more of a, a technocrat, ultimately, in terms of a thinking about the city as a manifestation of a larger structure for how people needed to relate in the world. So a combination of an engineering problem and a social observation, a socio-political set of observations. I don't know of any particular affinity, I'm coming around now to your question, I don't know of any particular affinity that Fuller had for the desert versus any place else. I chose the desert partly, to be totally honest with you, because it chose me, because Arizona State University has a museum that was willing not only to support the building of this camera, but also to agree to accepting the donation of the photograph in the year 3015 and contractually agreeing that the camera did not belong to them, but would return to me or my heirs at that point. And not only all of that, but also a uh, assigning an accession number, as it happens, the first accession number for 3015 to that photograph. So it was only in retrospect, I think, that I realized how perfect Tempe is as a model, as a place to look at, and then just exploited that for all it's worth, as you can tell in terms of how I talk about it. And then with a Holyoke range, once again, it was a matter of where the opportunity was and realizing that having those two in sympathy with each other was actually a, a very good place to start. But uh, 
it's going to get a lot more messy after this. I'm going to probably build, be building the next one in Singapore at a new university that is a combination, a sort of collaboration between Yale and uh, National Singapore University. This is still very much being discussed and figured out, but that looks like the next place. And at some point, it, I think, becomes something where they're all over the place. And so for me, the desert is fascinating. But once again, I think, like Fuller, it's not more fascinating than any other climate or any other place in the world. So it's been a long time since I've actually read Fuller, Fuller's, Fuller's works and stuff. And part of the thing in the uh, description of the talk was saying, OK, Fuller being meaningful to our world right now. And certainly, he's had tons of ideas, very important ideas. But it seems to me a lot of them are very higher level. And I'm just wondering if you could think of some very specific, more specific things that are actually things that people could use or should use in solving today's problems or approaching the world. Sure. Oh, first of all, I'll say as far as the Fuller as futurist anticipating, predicting something that actually came to pass, probably the easiest example would be to say that his idea of two-way TV, essentially a, a means by which you could decide what you wanted to watch and call it up at any time, is in many ways anticipating YouTube. And not only that, but more specifically, because it was educational in terms of the way that he was thinking about it, it that he was, in a sense, envisioning the MOOC. Uh, the, the massive online course. But I don't think that's what you're thinking about, and I don't think that it's very interesting, ultimately, to be honest. I think that what you're getting at is much more interesting and is much more aligned with why I wrote this book, which emphatically is not a biography. I am not a scholar. I do not know more about Fuller than anyone else in this room, most likely. I, however, see him as a great starting point for exploring a lot of ideas. And so I guess that probably one that comes to mind that might address what you're bringing up in a somewhat open-ended way, because I'm not an engineer either. I am a charlatan um, professionally. I would say that his dome over Manhattan project, that is to say the idea of building a geodesic dome that would enclose most of midtown New York is possibly the wackiest or one of the wackiest ideas he ever came up with, and one of the more implausible. But that it also is one of the more profound and actionable today for in ways that have nothing whatsoever to do with domes. And again, I think this echoes what we were talking about earlier, where the object has a tendency to be such a source of infatuation that you get away from the idea underlying it. So to me, it seems that, as I said a moment ago, cities really are most likely our future. And in terms of efficiency, cities can certainly allow for humans to coexist in the world with others at a higher level of efficiency, at a higher level of um, symbiosis than would otherwise be possible. And Yet at the same time, cities are where most energy gets expended right now. It's something like 75% at present. And a lot of it is about control of temperature. Too hot, too cold. So what is interesting to me is thinking about how the dome over Manhattan was a means by which to valve the thermodynamics, essentially. To, to be able to thermodynamically control conditions within the city in order to bring them into an optimal zone for those who inhabit it. And so in a time period where we are talking about climate change, and in many cases that leads to claims that geoengineering is the only way out of it, and counterclaims, which seem to me to be very justified, that effectively you are entering into a binding agreement with 
future generations that have no say in this to continue to pump those aerosols into the atmosphere and also doing so in a state of profound ignorance as to what the ultimate effect might be. That in fact, Fuller had identified, I think, with the Dome over Manhattan, a scale that is really quite possibly the right scale at which to be engineering today. That is to say that when we are building our individual houses and apartments with air conditioning and heating, we are contributing to climate change in terms of the, the emissions for the most part because it is highly inefficient. When we talk about solving climate change by way of, of geoengineering, we're talking about a planetary change of climate, of temperature. The mesoscale in between actually seems like it might be the right, might be the sweet spot. And it doesn't have to be a dome. So if we take Fuller's higher level thinking, which he resolved in the building of an object that he just so happened to have a patent on, and they just so happened to have an infatuation for, and that just so happened also to be the thing that he knew best, and we instead start thinking about how we, how we could start to optimize for uh, systems such as a geothermal exchange, such as a thermochromatic tiling, these things that are used somewhat uh, tentatively, arbitrarily, and not at all systematically for an entire city for the most part, if we start to think about how in a way that does not interfere with the flow of a city, these technologies could be engineered at that mesoscale of thinking about how to put them all together, solving for the city, solving for the climate of the city. It would be a way in which to, on the one hand, eliminate a lot of the emissions that come about through the inefficiencies of any given home and the, the, the heating and cooling that takes place, and on the other hand, to avoid the um, global scale folly of geoengineering. Okay, thanks. Though I think for in that case, just out of the top of my head, I would think building trees or some structures more like trees, something much smaller than a dome, much more decentralized, might uh, have a much bigger effect, especially since we haven't optimized our housing, you know, except for places like the desert where it becomes critical to extreme temperatures. But anyway, thank you. Well, yes, well, absolutely. And, and something such as a, ge a geothermal heat exchange system can be at any scale that you like. And I guess that what I'm thinking about it as, I'm thinking about it in terms of modular and small. And yes, trees. Uh, they are a very fine technology that have had a lot of R&D that have gone into them well beyond any of the other systems that we're talking about. So this will be our last question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that strikes me about this comprehensive thinking and the utopianism is, is that it's this great vision for the end state and, and, and this sort of gap in the, in the vision of how to get there, um, which sort of leads to the, these things, you know, become, being more in, in, in thought than in, in reality. Um, so I'm wondering if you could have paired Bucky with somebody in dialogue to sort of be his counterpoint and sort of a symbiotic relationship of what he was missing, who might that be? Stuart Brand. I think Stuart Brand is fascinating. I, I don't know that I would say that that would necessarily be the right guy. My, the right guy because of the question that you're asking, which is, I think, really a question of how do you you have hard reality here. You have the thought guy there, and what is What's the mesoscale here between those two? And Fuller would have claimed that he was um, because he only believed in those ideas that he could instantiate in physical objects, even if those physical objects by and large did not become objects that had any widespread or ubiquitous practical use. So partnering him with somebody literally would not work. Uh, he wouldn't abide it. Uh, in terms of intellectually partnering him, I think that someone who I bring up in the last chapter of the book, 
might be an interesting person to do so with him at greater length, at least I only touch on it, and that is uh, Victor Papanek. So uh, Papanek was a visionary like Fuller. The two of them admired each other. Fuller wrote the introduction to Papanek's most famous book, Design for the Real World, and Papanek was, as both of them readily acknowledged, a very different creature. Uh, he was somebody who was, for all that Fuller was grandiose, Papanek, Papanek was scrappy. And I think that that is perhaps the dialogue or the dichotomy or the uh, combination that might be most productive in terms of getting us somewhere. I think that it is the combination of the technocrat and the hacker, in a sense, not to pigeonhole either one of them, as I just have done, but to say that it, it requires this sort of top-down utopianism in order to keep in mind what we're talking about, but also this bottom-up tinkering that might be able to keep us at a scale of doing and also keep us humble in a way that would be the balance necessary to keep the technocratic side of utopianism in check. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Our interlocutor.